Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, before we begin the study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your Spirit's presence here as we open your word together. We know, Lord, that there is much that we do not understand, and we ask to be corrected by you. Help, help us in uh, discerning truth from error and applying the symbols correctly. And we pray, Lord, that in all this, we can have a deeper faith and trust in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again, and welcome to this week's studies. Now, we were addressing, uh, on Thursday, we were addressing Tychus Epiphanes, Tychus the fourth, and uh, the differences that we have between um, um, Swearingen's view of Daniel 11, verse 15, and uh, the views of Uriah Smith. So we're going to go back there. Uh, we'll look at Swearingen again. And... Um, So first, so just before we go back there, so this is, this was his, uh, taken from his book. Now, originally he had the king of the north there being Antiochus IV, so Antiochus Epiphanes. And he's going to have this um, not being the Battle of Paneum, but as other events, right, that, that happened further down. And we're saying that this is Paneum. But I want to look at his view here so um so he's going to have verse 14 the paneum but he's going to move uh verse 15 to a later time period so let's take a look at what he says okay so we, we read these verses again and in those times there shall be many stand up against the king of the south and the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities. Um, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. The Battle of Paneum, 2000, or 201 or 200 BC, so I think we generally take 200 BC, resulted in the expulsion of Egypt from hollow Syria once and for all, while at the same time, seriously weakening its status as a Mediterranean power. Having become vulnerable to foreign invasion, this defeat had marked the beginning of the end for Ptolemaic Egypt. Many in those times would stand up against the king of the south. And this would be especially true in the career of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He had launched a successful invasion of Egypt that would later bring pagan Rome directly into Middle Eastern affairs, and eventually lead to the demise of both the Seleucid and Ptolemaic dynasties. After the death of Ptolemy V Epiphanes, another young boy king, Ptolemy VI Philometor, would ascend to the throne at a very young age. This young king would be under the guardianship of two ministers of state, Julius and Linnaeus, who began to plan another invasion of hollow Syria in revenge for the Egyptian defeat at the Battle of Nea. Despite a recent warning from Rome, Antiochus IV proposed um, to defeat the plan of Elias and Linnaeus by launching a first strike invasion of Egypt. As it turned out, Rome was still involved in the affairs of Greece and dealing with King Perseus of Macedonia and could not involve itself in this particular uh, conflict. Furthermore, Antiochus IV moved with such speed that he actually met the Egyptian army before they even crossed the desert into southern Syria. Because the arms of the south would not have any strength to withstand him, Antiochus IV crushed the Egyptian army so convincingly that he marched unopposed into Egypt and occupied the city of Memphis. Meanwhile, at Alexandria, Julius and Linnaeus had been overthrown and replaced by two new ministers of state, Commodus and Sinius, who proclaimed the younger brother of Ptolemy VI as king, Ptolemy VII, Euagirdes. Um, uh, uh, Eurgirdes II, so is there's, I guess that's the second title, satisfied that Egypt was divided in an internal conflict between two rival brother kings, Antiochus IV withdrew and returned home to Syria. 
It is interestingly, though, Ptolemy VI and Ptolemy VII formed an alliance and agreed to share the throne of Egypt. This alarming development moved Antiochus IV to rethink his position and reinvade the king of the south in the next year, 168. Once again, he met with no resistance, mar marching both into both Memphis and Alexandria, meanwhile having defeated King Perseus of Macedonia with the victory of Pydna in 168. Rome was now in a position to intervene in behalf of Egypt. The Roman embassy, headed by Gaius Pompilius Linnaeus, met Antiochus IV at Alexandria in the same year. As the two men greeted, Pompilius promptly uh, took his staff and drew a circle on the ground around the feet of the Seleucid king, ordering him to evacuate Egypt at once. He was not allowed to step outside the circle until he had acquiesced to Rome's demands. Thus, under the threat of Roman intimidation, Antiochus IV agreed to withdraw, and Rome, the Roman ambassadors escorted both him and his army safely out of Egypt. In addition to being one of the many Seleucid kings that would stand up against the king of the south, Antiochus IV would also be one of the robbers of thy people, namely Daniel's people Israel, while occupying Egypt the second time. Antiochus IV had heard that Jerusalem had rebelled against Seleucid rule and declared for Ptolemy, still upset from his humiliation at the hands of Rome and in desperate need of financial resources. Antiochus IV viewed this defection as treason and sought to exact revenge by plundering the city and the temple. Because Daniel's chosen people could not withstand him, Antiochus IV would successfully invade Jerusalem and rob the people of Daniel. He would strip the sanctuary of its treasures plunder the resources of the city and murder thousands of people, selling many more thousands into slavery. Antiochus would also eventually pass a royal edict to ban Judaism and implement a policy of forced Hellenism, erecting pagan altars and instituting sacrifices in the process. In essence, he desired the total eradication of the Jewish culture and religion, but this desire would ultimately backfire. By sending his army back into Judea with the intention of committing genocide, Antiochus had actually provoked a Jewish revolt that would arise under the leadership of Judas Maccabeus. This revolt would eventually result in the complete removal of the Seleucid presence from Judea altogether. Thus, Antiochus IV, who attempted to exalt himself by robbing the people of Daniel, would ultimately fall and fail to establish the vision. Which makes no sense. <laughs> um, Overall, as we blend Bible prophecy with the record of history, we can see that the passage of Daniel 11, 5 to 15 describes a very interesting historical period consisting of the five Syrian wars between Hellen Hellenistic Seleucid Syria, the king of the north, north of Palestine, and Hellenistic Ptolemaic Egypt, the king of the south, south of Palestine, over the region of Judea, Palestine, which is Col Syria, or hollow Syria. In this interim period of history that spanned from the death of Alexander the Great, 323 BC, to the rise of pagan Rome, 168 BC, Syria and Egypt fought these five Syrian wars at different times, spanning the re reigns of several different kings from each of these two powers. In conclusion, God has included this era of history in the Bible because these five Syrian wars had a direct effect on his chosen people at that time namely the Jewish people who were located in the region of hollow Syria, that is Judeo-Palestine. So um, we can see here that he's going to have um, this view that Antiochus IV is the king of the north referred to in verse 15. Right. So we don't accept this view for a number of th reasons, um, but we're going we're gonna to look at Uriah Smith's view and uh, try to uh, de address some of these problems um, that are then presented. So when we go to verse 15, remember Uriah Smith doesn't state anything about the Battle of Paneum, but he does imply it. Um, so... <clears throat> On the wrong one. There we go. So the king of the north shall come, cast up a mount, and take the most fenced cities. And the arms of the south shall not be notwithstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. The education of the young king of Egypt was entrusted to the Roman Senate, by the Roman Senate, to Emilius Lepidus, who appointed Arist 
Aristomenes, an old and experienced minister of that court, to be his guardian. His first act was to provide against the threatened invasion of two confederated kings, Philip, king of Macedon, and Antiochus uh, III, the king of, of Syria. To this end, he dispatched Scopus, a famous general of Atolia, then in the service of the Egyptians, into his native country to raise reinforcements for the army. After equipping an army, he marched into Palestine and hollow Syria, Antiochus being engaged in a war with Atalus of Lesser Asia and reduced all Judea to the authority of Egypt. Thus, affairs were brought about for the fulfillment of the verse before us. Assisting from his war with Atalus at the dictation of the Romans, Antiochus took speedy steps for the recovery of Palestine and hollow Syria or Judea, Palestine, right, from the hands of the Egyptians. Scopus was sent to oppose him near the sources of the Jordan. So this is Paneum, as we looked at. The two armies met. Scopus was defeated, pursued to Sidon, and there closely besieged. Three of the ablest generals of Egypt, with their best forces, were sent to raise the siege, but without success. At length, Scopus, meeting a foe in the specter of famine with which he was unable to cope, was forced to surrender in the dishonorable term of life, terms of life only. He and his 10,000 men were permitted to depart, stripped and destitute. Here was the taking of the most fenced cities by the king of the north, for Sidon was in its situation and defenses, one of the strongest cities of those times. Here was the failure of the arms of the south to withstand, and the failure also of the people which the king of the south had chosen, namely Scopus and his Aetolian forces. Now, so these are quite different views of verse 15. Now, of course, it goes back to Rome, uh, to Rome being the robbers of thy people, right? So, so this history before where we're going to say that the robbers of the people exalt themselves to establish the vision. Now, in uh, Swearingen's view, that they fail to establish the vision which doesn't make any sense because we understand this vision is the Kazo, right? This is the, the 2520, the two desolating powers, paganism and papalism, right? So he wouldn't, you know, if he's exalting himself to establish the vision, I mean, and he fails in it, well, then he didn't establish the vision. Right. So it's it's kind of confusing what swearing has done. Now, the reason we address these things is we're we're interested in establishing things solidly. Right? So we need to look at other views. And, and since we're using swearing uh, outline of Daniel 11, uh, placing in the historical application, we definitely need to address this. So we can address first that. The robbers of thy people must be Rome, and that the explanation given by Uriah Smith is sufficient to see this. The Romans, more than any other people, are sub the subject of Daniel's prophecy. Their first inference, interference in the affairs of these kingdoms is here referred to as being the establishment or demonstration of the truth of the vision which predicted the existence of such a power. But they shall fall is referred by some of those mentioned to the first part of the verse, who should stand up against the king of the south, other to the robbers of Daniel's people. So the idea that Swearingen has is he they exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they fail to do so, but they shall fall or fail. Well, that doesn't really make any sense if this is Antiochus the fourth, being the robbers of thy people. Because if he fails to establish the vision, then he didn't establish the vision. And he's not going to exalt himself to establish the vision as if he understands what the vision is. So uh, now when it comes to they shall fall, how did we understand that? So Uriah Smith says it could be referred to uh, Rome or it could refer to uh, the king of the south. Um, let me see here. They shall fall is referred by some to those mentioned in the first part of the verse, who should stand up against the king of the south, pardon me, those who stand up against the king of the south, that is the king of the north, others to the robbers of Daniel's people, the Romans. 
It's true in either case, but it needs to be one or the other. Um, if it applies to the Romans, the prophecy simply pointed to the period of their final overthrow. And we think that that must be what it's referring to because it's talking about the vision that they stand up and exalt, right? They exalt themselves. Uh, they shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. That this would be pointing to either the end of pagan Rome or of both pagan and papal Rome to the whole period. Any comments on that? I mean, it, it's to me what makes the most sense. So if we look at this, we know that verse 13 is talking about the Battle of Pinion, right? So the, the king of the north shall return, shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after many years with a great army and much riches. Why many years when it says certain years? Certain years, pardon me. Yeah, after certain years with great army and much rich, riches. And we took this term certain years um, because we have the... Uh, the Hebrew numbers, of course, you know, most people would never do what we're doing here. And we're taking certain years as being a period of 17 years and 46 days, and we're adding 360 to it by taking the number 6 times 2 times 5 times 6, which equals 360, and adding it to Shanaim, right? So we get that period, which is um, exactly the period from... Uh, November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030. So obviously other people wouldn't be able to see this uh, unless they understood what we understood. So, um, so we know that in this here, this uh, verse, which is dealing with Paneum, that if we are going to address it on our lines, that it would suggest that as a symbol, April 5th, 2030 stands as Paneum. Would that make sense? I mean, it's kind of a wild prediction based on what, we, what we've done. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But it stands as a symbol of Paneum. We're not saying April 5th, 2030 is going to be the Battle of Paneum, because I don't think it's going to be a single day or anything like that. But then definitely, if we're looking at midnight as still future, um, which would be Raphia, this would be uh, a time in which uh, the defeat of the King of the North occurs, where this atheistic communism predominates, it prevails, it wins a battle of the ideologies over that of apostate Protestantism. But apostate Protestant comes and defeats atheistic communism because of its failure, uh, and for whatever reason it's going to fail. This is sort of the interpretation we're having of Raffi and Paneum. So we're saying that um, it's going to come after certain years. So that's going to bring us to April 5th, 2030. Now, it says after certain years. It could be just April 5th, 2030 is the period in which uh, that could be Raphia as well. It could be just that that's referring to Raphia. And so after Raphia, um, then we have the Battle of Paneum. But then it refers back to in those times, right? So again, we can see the same word, certain years in those times many shall stand up against the king of the south now if we think about the king of the south as this ideology so it's not just that the king of the north is going to come against atheistic communism but also many shall Now, in this case, it has those times. So we had certain years, and now we have those times. Now, the thing about certain is you can take 
six times two times five times six, um, that's going to be 360. And, and now we have those times. So we have uh, 360 here. Um, so, so we have that, that symbol there. Now, what about those? Um, and this is kind of where we stopped last week. Hi, Stephen. Have you, have you been following the studies from last week? I've um, been watching uh, much uh, the start of them anyway, the, to a certain point, and then the next one comes on, and I'll start watching the next one. So you get the whole entire day, but yeah, okay. getting adjusted. So you get the idea of what's happening. Right of of this, so we have um, yeah, and sometimes at the beginning I do sort of explain what we studied the previous previous times. So so we have we have these symbols of certain years. So you understand that part of how we did that, getting uh, whatever it was. Uh, I can't remember how many it was three six five. Yes, but um, yeah, so well, certain is 360, six times two times five times six. So we added 360 to uh, 6256, and uh, hang on a second here. So I have um, 360 plus 6256. Six, and then I added uh, the years, 8141. So I get 14,757 days. And that's the number of days from November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030. So I'm saying that after that, that this, where it says after certain years, certain years gives us that line that we've established at least now for almost two years of April 5th, 2030 going from November 9th, 1989. So the fact that those two Hebrew numbers yield that, I think, is significant. And then it says, in those times, now, um, these, those, whatever you want the Hebrew to say there, uh, it's referring specifically to this times, to this certain, because literally it would be, and he shall certainly come after times, years, Right? or years of times, something like that, right? With the great army, much riches. So this is the start of the battle of Panim. And then it's going to say, in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south, right? So this, this is talking about the battle of Panim. Also the robbers of thy people. So this is referring now to Rome. And if we're applying this to our line, this would have to be where the papacy comes in and exalts themselves to establish the vision. Now, of course, the papacy ultimately will fall, both historically and in the future. So this would be talking about the time of the threefold union. So it's using the phrase, those times. Now, um, if I was going to add these together, so the 6256 um, with this other would be a period of eight two four eight days, right? So that's going to be um, a period of twenty two years, and uh, I can't remember twenty two years and two hundred and twelve days. So I don't know what that means, and and trying to place that somewhere, I've I've looked at trying to place it where it would be placed. Um, I don't have a definite place. Um, if I put it in, um, I'm trying to remember what I did. Um, yeah, so if I go from September 11th, um, 2001, it brings me to April 11th, 2024. And that, was, I think, was the only significant date uh, 
a significant span. Now, April 11th is important um, as a symbol. It's important. It's a symbol of information for 11 in North America. Um, uh, it's also connected to well, Heidi's birthday. So people would think that's not important, but she's already there in the lines. And uh, so April 11th, 2024. So it's something that's coming up in the future. And um, and it and it's uh, the Mayan date 1189, which would be November 89. It ties us back there. It happens to be um, Nissan 2, not Nissan 1, on the um, biblical calendar. It would be neat if it was Nissan 1. But anyway, that's as far as I can go. It would, if I did it as an inclusive count, it would be Nissan 1 in 2024. It would be the first day of the first month in 2024. But anyway, that's that's all I could do with that number as it was. Now, um, you know, I could say, well, add another 360 and, you know, I get April 6, 2025, which doesn't really help me, right? Okay, so, so those are the types of things I've been trying to figure out with this, um, um, with this phrase. So in those times, so I don't know what else to do with it. Um, Excuse me, Theodore. Where does the eight two four eight come in? Because you mentioned eight two four eight days, twenty two years, twelve two hundred twelve days. But what is that? Two ninety two to six two five six. Oh, okay. You just added those together. So nineteen ninety two plus six two five six is eight two four eight. Right. So, um, and that's what we had been doing with other ones, just adding the Hebrew numbers together. Okay. And, um, no, but getting just back to the broader ideas here, if we take this as referring to what happened historically, we can see we can see that what happened with Rome exalting itself uh, to establish the vision, uh, this is going to be their interference in what is happening with the dividing up of to to telemic, um, uh, acquisitions, right? So, but we know Rome says you, you can't, you can't conquer Egypt, right? You, you can divide those things, but we're, we're going to protect Egypt, right? And, and we can see why Rome would do this. Rome is worried about uh, the Seleucid Empire basically becoming too powerful. Okay. So then when we see the Battle of Paneum, that's going to be verse 15. So the king of the north shall come, cast up the mountain, take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand. Neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. So that is the end of it. It doesn't go to Antiochus Epiphanes, as Swearingen tries to do. It goes to the Battle of Paneum. Now, it is, it isn't really... Sunday law, the Battle of Paneum, isn't the Sunday law, but it is the precursor to the Sunday law. Now, when we get to verse 16, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. We know that this is Rome, right? This is, is pagan Rome. Okay, so, so we have that understanding. Now, uh, so when we go back to our, our chart, uh, we get brought to this April 5th, 2030 date. So, and, and I still prefer 200 BC for the Battle of Paneum, right? 
rather than 201. Um, yeah, there's some data scuff as uh, 198. Yeah, I know. There's a variety of dates. I, I sort of prefer 200, but nobody knows the exact date for the Battle of Panin, right? You know, you could put, you could just do this. That might be better. Circa 200 BC. So that means about. We just don't know when that battle was. Um, so the King of the North and Tychus is the third in this case. And in our application, we're going to have this be the United States. King of the North shall come. And, and saying this is April 5th, 2030. We're just saying that that's the date that's being suggested from our understanding of the symbols they should and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities of judah right which is going to be uh sidon um and i think that's what it is what we understand from uriah smith um, but this is going to be the Battle of Panium. So in the arms of the south, the Egyptian army under Ptolemy V. So trying to understand what this symbol is, the most fenced cities, the arms of the south. Um, we're going to have to figure that out. Um, and notwithstand, lose the Battle of Panium. So... Again, just specifically what that, that would mean. Neither is chosen people. The Jewish people couldn't resist the Syrian occupation of Judea. And neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Syria would dominate uh, Palestine and Judea under Antiochus III. So we're saying that, that we need to understand this in a present truth application. Is there an understanding that the, the the people there, that the chosen people, is actually referring to those whom Rome chose to help the king of the south rather than the Jews? Okay. Okay. So, yeah, and that's that we have to examine. So I'm, I'm using some of this from um, uh, Swearingen, right? Neither his chosen people. So the question is, who is his? Is this the Jewish people, right? Or, or are you saying it's those that were chosen by the king of the south? Or the king of the north? Who is the chosen people? In or those, those who were chosen by Rome to help oh. about the, uh, the king of the south. Okay. So you would have an interpret this would be Rome's? Chosen people? Yes. Um, and these chosen people would be? I think it says Scopus or something. I think uh, Uriah Smith mentions. Okay, so we're going to put here Scopus and others. Is that how you do that abbreviation? Um, so we would have to think about this and how this would apply in a present truth application. Um, so when it says, though, and the arms of the South, that's the Egyptian army under Ptolemy shall not withstand. Lose the battle of Canaan. Neither Rome's chosen people. So the people that Rome chose to support uh, Egypt, right? That's what you're saying? That's what I 
remember when I okay I could be wrong I don't have my notes with me but uh, I'm, that kind of comes to mind yeah yeah so but, well this this fits in but you know, we still have to examine it you know, everything's still on the table as far as trying to understand what this is referring to, both in the historic application and in the present truth application. Um, but the idea here with the Battle of Paneum is that we have this clash of ideologies. We have this atheistic communism. It's got all kinds of other tags we could attach to it. Um, but it's going to have its day on an international level that is its in some way going to be tried. That is, the goals of the globalists, you know, often symbolized by uh, the World Economic Forum, are going to be implemented, much to uh, the destruction of society. And we could see that if you had um, the global economy collapsing, this would mean uh, mass starvation, uh, an uprising rebellion of the poorer classes, uh, not just, you know, internationally, but of course also in the United States, everyone would be affected. And uh, this would open the way for uh, the backlash, right? The apostate Protestantism, the United States coming in and taking control of things. So one of the problems that I've had, and I've said this many, many times, is how do we get a secular world to accept a religious Sunday law? And um, we would need something like this on a global scale uh, to be attempted in order to, for that ideology that's, that's been growing and developing and uh, slowly defeating apostate Protestantism in the world uh, to have its day, right? So it would have to have its day and there would have to be the backlash. And we know that the United States is the power that's going to cause all the world to wonder after the beast and, to, and worship the beast and his image, right? So, uh, so this fits in with what we understand already. Doesn't mean that we're correct in how we're interpreting this, right? Because we could be reading into this text things that aren't there. But there are things that we believe, such as, you know, Rome comes in to establish the vision, exalts themselves to establish the vision in verse 14, and that this can't be Antiochus Epiphanes, as Swearingen says. So we believe that Uriah Smith is correct on this point. Um So it doesn't bring us to 168 BC, as Swearingen tries to do. He tries to bring us to that history. This is just going to bring us to, you know, 200 BC, around there, where, whenever the Battle of Paneum is. Any other thoughts of what we've talked about so far and how we can address this? So, Stephen, as far as this interpretation of, of verse 15, the historic, does that look correct to you? That it's the Battle of Paneum that's being referred to. Yes, I think it's more like the the after, aftermath of the battle, because you have the battle in, in Paneum, and then they're going to, uh, the King of the South forces are then going to uh, flee in a sense, from that battle and go to Sidon, and then they're going to be right um, see, besieged there. So he has sort of, yeah, it is connected to Panium. Yeah. That's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and I never saw that before. Um, you know, I just sort of looked at the battle of Panium as being uh, uh, verse 14, right? Or verse 13, actually as being the Battle of Paneum, because that's, you know, we put the Battle of Paneum there, 
That's how we had always looked at it before. Um, so yeah, so I, they had the Battle of Paneum 201 to 200 BC, driving Egypt out of Judea, Palestine once and for all, right? So that's the midnight cry. Now, when it comes to this midnight cry on Jeff's line, so the line we had back in 2016 with 9-11 midnight, midnight cry Sunday long, we know that we have been going through various midnights and midnight cries within our lines, which are just zooms in to um, a, dip, a, a lower level of these lines, right? So we know that there is a midnight and a midnight cry on Jeff's line. And either we are just coming into that midnight in our history right now, um, or we have begun that midnight, maybe on that bigger line. And so these skirmishes that we see happening between uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats aren't the midnight cry on the big line, that the midnight cry and midnight on the big line are more international in scope. So that what's happening within the United States presently uh, with Trump and Biden and all those different things they are a Raffi and Paneum in type, but they aren't Raffi and Paneum. But it still might, it might still might represent that. So there is a way in which the Republicans can come back and win. Um, and that would be a type of Paneum uh, in our lines, but they would not be the Paneum on Jeff's line. And so this has been a real problem with this movement when we start to address uh, our line, if we don't understand fully that what we're seeing now is not on Jeff's big line that he had before, then we're expecting the Sunday law to come immediately. And you know, the idea that the Sunday law is still, that there are things that have to occur before the Sunday law. Definitely we don't see what's supposed to happen between Rafi and Benium happening now, Right. We don't have the joining of the two sticks. Um, you know, we don't we haven't given the message to the Levites. Um, there's just so many things that aren't happening that we would need to have happen to say that midnight, that we're between midnight and the midnight cry. And that the Sunday law is imminent, that we're gonna have, you know, Republicans take over in this next election or even before. Now, the suggestion is that Jeff is stating that, that Trump's going to become the president of the United States without winning an election. But I'm not sure if that's particularly true or not, if that's what he's saying in his articles. But there is a, a rumor going around that that's what he's saying. Anybody have any insight on that? Jeff, Dwight, have you seen in his articles that he says Trump is going to become president without the election? If you're there, Dwight. Dwight not, might not be there. I, I haven't seen it, that I, but I haven't read every article. So, so there. Anyway, there's this rumor going around that Jeff is supporting the idea that Trump's going to become president. He he does mention where he talks about the um the um the twenty the twenty four twenty the the um president that received the deadly wound will be healed in two thousand twenty four. Okay. But he doesn't say two thousand election. He don't say election. He just says the president that had the deadly wound will be healed in 2024. Yeah. Now, there's is there is there a rumor that he's saying that it's going to happen? With with Steve said that he sit down with. With this is Steve's telling telling oh. um me that he sat down with Steve with Jeff, and Jeff yeah. said that's what he was saying. Okay. 
Yeah. So that's a second-hand account. Well, I guess I got it from you. Yes, it there. is. Yes, it is. It's, it's Steve, Steve's the one that said it, so I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So, so we don't know what Jeff's actually saying because I, I haven't seen in his articles. He does think that Trump's going to become president and bring in the Sunday law. And and there still is this suggestion that it, it's not going to be with an election, that, that, that that's the rumor right? that is just going to come in. So something happens and Trump is made president without being elected to president. Now... You know, it's very possible that Trump becomes president. I mean, it's possible. It, it, it's nothing that says that he has to. Um, what we have from the the lines of the Persian kings is that um, that that we are in the time of Biden. He's the one that is, and the one that's to come is going to be this civil war king, right? So in that in that period of time, we're going to have a lot of bad things happen. So whether that's a Democrat or a Republican, whether it's a Republican, but somebody other than Trump, it's hard to see the future in that regard. But what we do know if, uh, is that the papacy comes in after that. Yeah, Stephen? Has anyone considered that if Biden was to something happen with him um, and soon, whatever, he stopped being president and then Kamala Harris would be president. So she would be the seventh, and that would be like a short space before the eighth, which would okay. potentially be Trump again. Well, the eighth, so, can't just, be president. the eighth can't be a president of the United States. The Bible plainly tells us the eighth is the beast that was and is not. Even he is the eighth, right? Mm -hmm. so, so whoever the eighth is, um, you know, whoever the president is after the seventh, because I'm not saying that there isn't going to be another president. Because what we have done is we've we've said that those seven kings of Persia, the first seven kings of Persia and the last seven kings of Judah, all are being uh, typifications of what's happening with these seven kings. And those seven kings are not the seven heads or the seven mountains. Those are the seven kings of, of Persia, right? The two-horned beast that arises from the earth, the United States. So there's other kings of Persia that exist after the seven king, first seven kings of Persia. So we're just saying that, that those seven kings there are to be understood in our history leading up to these events of the Sunday law, you know, Paneum and all those things, right? So, yeah, so if, if I mean, if you have Kamala Harris become the seventh, I mean, I don't know if that's that's going to happen. I don't think that the, the Democrats would do that. They would just wait until, you know, just have Biden retire. There would be no reason to, to pull him out of office unless he dies, um, then you'd have to put somebody else in place. But, um, you know, even if he dies, they could still have him as a puppet, you know, just, uh, you know, do some uh, AI videos of him reading speeches. Um, you know, they might not want Kamala Harris to become president. But anyway, um, those are all speculations. The, the point that we have here, if we're looking at the parallel, you can see that with the Persian kings, we have the seven, right? And then the globalists come, right? And then we take that history of Alexander and we put it over top of our history again, right? Alexander, his kingdom falling, that's the, the USSR. And then we have um, these battles between the North and the South, between these two ideologies going on. And it, and it, works its way to become uh, not just something within the United States fighting against atheistic communism. It becomes that the world embraces this King of the South ideology and then the King of the North ideology defeats it ultimately, which is going to lead to the Sunday law. And so all it would have to do to have these seven kings, if we're going to put them in here, is um, 
to have these presidents that lead up to that history. So that'd be the history of, you know, the image of the beast being formed. Doesn't mean there wouldn't be other presidents. They just wouldn't be significant in placing them as, as kings or presidents of the United States, dealing with Revelation 17. So, so I understand what you're saying. Like we have lots of different scenarios of how things might unfold, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter who becomes king, who becomes president. Um, what, what's important is that we're in the now is, the one that is, and that is in the time of Biden. And so we are going to, in, in our history, our history is typical. So we know that, that what's ha been happening within the United States is going to happen on a worldwide scale. And so it's very possible that the agenda of the WEF will be implemented on an international scale. Like we might, might, might have a temporary sort of backlash, but that backlash can't itself be Paneum. Because it's there's so much that has to happen beforehand. Right? Because if we're talking about Rafi and Paneum on Jeff's line, you know, midnight and midnight cry, and then the Sunday law. Whatever happens in the United States as far as apostate Protestantism winning over globalism, you know, wokeism being dis destroyed in some way, that can't be that big line. It can't be that line that Jeff had created in the past. <clears throat> and so we can have types of the Sunday law and, and a, you know, a precursor to the Sunday law happening, some kind of religious persecution, something like that. But the actual Sunday law in the United States has to come at the time of the Sunday law, after Raffi and Panin. And we're not even to Raffi yet. Maybe just on, on the verge of it, just on the border of it. And to say, well, they're going to happen just really quickly. Well, there is still the logistics of the fact that we have to get a me message to Seventh-day Adventists. And we don't even really have a message to give them. And we are in a movement that's in a disarray. Unless we're arguing that our movement has nothing to do with Bible prophecy. So, <clears throat> Dwight, are you there yet? I'm here. Okay. Were you here when I asked the question to you before? No. Okay. I don't remember what the question was. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, it has it has to do with the idea that um, you know, obviously, we can't have Antiochus epiphanies in verse fifteen. This has to right. be the back. And um, we do have that date, April fifth, twenty thirty, coming from uh, certain years, right? So after certain years, that that definitely fits in there. And and I'm not really sure yet how to. Uh, fit the phrase um, dealing with um, in those times, right? So I still have to think about that. But that does bring us to, you know, the Jewish New Year in, in 2024. Right. Uh, so, but I don't know if that's significant or if there's some other place to place this. So we, we just we still have to wait on that. But but there is a symbol there. So we know that the word times and the word certain are the same word, 6256. Six, six. And um, we know that there's these ideologies. So the idea that this is bigger than what we're going through right now with Rafi and Panin, I think we have to take that position. I don't think we can take the position that the actual Rafi on Jeff's line from 2016, where you've got 9-11, midnight, midnight, try Sunday long. The actual raffia is, you know, January 6th, 2021, or even January 20th, 2021. You can't, you can't put that there. Um, also, you know, since we can't put that there, we can't say that Paneum is going to be this election coming up. 
because none of the stuff that's supposed to happen is happening as far as what, what this movement is supposed to be doing. It's work. But we can say that those things are typifying what's going to come. And we keep running into this April 5th, 2030 day. So to me, when I, when I took certain years and I did that calculation, right, by adding the two together and adding the 360 from the word certain, um, and I find that it, it goes from uh, November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030, this date we already have. I would have to say that that moves Midnight in the Midnight Cry to that history, not, not necessarily to that date as a specific date, but it just moves it to this reapplication of time, that we're, we're moved to a further date, not to our present history, right? Whatever that date is, whenever it's going to happen, it, it can't be this present history. This present time that we're in, the events that we are in, cannot be Rafi and Panin on that line. That's that's all it's telling me. <clears throat> no, and that I would agree. <laughs> now, and remember also, we have 9-11 and... April 5th, 2030, connected with the 354 months, the 354 days from the Book of Ezra, right? Correct. 450 BC. We already have attached it to that. So if we, we take the months and we start the month in which 9-11 occurs, you know, we have that attached to 2030. And, um, but we also know that if we can take 9-11, we can match it with both November 9th, right? So we can match it with the arrival of the first message on uh, November 9th, 1989. And we can attach it to the November 9th, 2019 date in that it's the arrival of the second angel's message. So those two dates go together, or all three dates go together. And we saw in your studies in the summer dealing with 191 BC. So 191 BC being the center of the 62 weeks. And so we're, we're going to address that a little bit more as we start moving into to Rome itself. Um, but Rome is here to establish the vision. That is, these powers, the king of the south and the king of the north and the papacy, do create a... Um, I was going to say a collision, but it's a, a collusion. Um you know, they, they join together at some point, right? We have this threefold union. Right. And and so they're all being introduced here, right? You have Rome in history symbolizing the papacy, um, supporting the king of the south. Now, do we see that presently happening as well? We would say that the papacy is definitely supporting the king of the south as opposed to the king of the north being the United States. And, and it's not, not just, you know, it's, you know, it's not just Trump that the papacy is opposed to. Right. The papacy doesn't want the United States to. Like it supported the United States. They joined together to overthrow the Soviet Union. But the papacy isn't completely in agreement with the United States. E even under Biden, right? Correct. So, so the United States and the papacy and the globalists, they have been in conflict with each other. Sometimes they become allies with Two of them become allies together to some degree because of the power of the other. But the papacy, it's trying to side, it's trying to even out that power, right? Because it needs to step in. It doesn't want to be defeated by any of these powers. And that's true of Rome as well, right? So, so Rome doesn't want to see the Seleucid Empire become too powerful. So it sides with uh, the Ptolemic Empire. 
And so we have that happening in our history. But we're saying that that's going to happen on a larger scale. Okay, so what I like to do is I like to put some red type in here. So if we say that the king of the north in the Battle of Paneum, they're going to have this Battle of Paneum, shall come. Now it shall cast up a, mount, up, a, up a mount and take the most fenced cities. So this is Sidon, right? Now what is this going to represent? You know, So Uriah Smith is going to say that this is, you know, so after this battle of Paneum, right, um, how does he put it here? Um, I brought about the fulfillment of the verse, de desisting from his war with Italius at the dictation of the Romans and Tychus to speedy steps to recover from Palestine and coal Syria from the hands of the Egyptians. Scopus was sent to oppose him, right? So he's... Um, this Roman um, dealing with uh, supporting Egypt near the sources of the Jordan, right? The two armies met. So you can have this battle in Paneum. That's the sources of the Jordan. Scopus was defeated, pursued to Sidon, and they're closely besieged. So he's going to take the most fenced cities, right? So we have the battle, and then we have Sidon. Um Three of the ablest generals of Egypt with their best forces were sent to raise the siege, but without success. At, the, at length, Scopus, meeting a foe in the specter of famine with which he was unable to cope, was forced to surrender on the dishonorable terms of life only. He and his 10,000 men were permitted to depart, stripped and destitute. Here was the taking of the most fenced cities by the king of the north. Poseidon was in its situation and defense as one of the strongest cities of those times. Here was the failure of the arms of the South to withstand and the failure also of the people which the King of the South had chosen, namely Scopus and his Aetolian forces. Um, so, so we have here these, these other forces that are chosen uh, to go against the... Um, uh, the Seleucid Empire, right in the Battle of Paneum. So how do we understand this in its present truth application? Well, why are we not breaking this down just a little bit further? Okay. Okay. You read correctly and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities. What does it mean to cast, to cast up a mount? Well, that's usually uh, like a rampart to try to take over a city. So it's like uh, to, to go over the wall. To take over a city. So the city is under siege. Yeah, yeah. You're casting up a mount. You're, you're going to try to besiege it. Yeah. Isn't the Constitution of the United States currently under siege by those that are supportive of Biden? Okay. Um, okay. So if we are, if we're going to take that this is the Constitution, right? So we know it's the King of the North that's going, to, which you're saying is the United States in our time under Antiochus the Third, which we're going to place Antiochus the Third as. Um, This is dealing with republicanism and Protestantism, right? Correct. So um, how did we do that? So we had Philip, King of Macedon, and Antiochus III. We didn't actually put in there what they represented. So I don't have, for some reason, I don't have that in red. Um, but we did talk about it. So... I don't know why. I think I might, might have just not got saved because I was pretty sure we put here um, apostate Republican something like that. That's what I thought we had.
We might have had them earlier, but I, don't, I thought for sure that we put them there. Okay. So we're going to have this apostate Protestantism and apostate uh, Republicanism, or the other way around. Stand up and make war against the King of the South. So this making war, we, we tend to see this as uh, propaganda. Okay. So the King of the South here, we usually have Ptolemy the first, fourth, Philopater as being, oh, we just put Biden. Right, so that's that's what we had done with uh, in this history. So we got Biden in there. Um, you know, it's the king of the south. You know, we could say it's atheistic communism, but as far as Ptolemy the fourth, Philopater himself, marks Biden. Uh, if I remember correctly, that's how we did it. Um, we had them up here too. Um, so that's why we had Seleucus the third and then Tychus Magnus. So maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm going back and getting confused here. Maybe I'm reading back to what we were doing earlier. I think but, you are. Yeah, I think I am. Okay, so then what would we put here if we're going to have Philip, King of Macedon, and Antiochus III? Yeah, so Antiochus III we had as USA. Okay. So this would be some other power. So this wouldn't be apostate republicanism and Protestantism. Um because, yeah, I was yeah, I'm, I'm getting mixed up. Okay. I hope you allow me to do that once in a while, because I do. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, Antiochus III. So, this is the USA, but somebody else. So, who's the somebody else? Who's Philip, King of Macedon, symbolized? Is Philip, King of Macedon, the globalists? No, these aren't the globalists in this case. I mean, all, all we're doing right now is we're, use, we're applying Miller's rules. We're trying to see what other options there are and see what fits. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, if we take Antiochus the Thorpe, Third is the United States. There are other nations um, that are going to oppose the globalists, right? Now, Macedon itself is, it ends up being, it's a part of Greece, right? Sort of. I mean, it's a separate Correct. kingdom, but it, it ends up being part, part of Greece to some degree. Right. They're, they're Greek peoples, but they're not necessarily. Uh, um, you know, so there, so in our time, I mean, the United States is the king of the north, but there is other forces or other powers, other countries that are supporting what's happening as far as the ideology of apostate Protestantism. Um, Yeah, I don't know lots about Philip, king of Macedon. I mean, there's lots of different Philip's kings of Macedon because it was a popular name for their kings. You know, <clears throat> yeah. we, we, is the fence city, is it, is it the Constitution or not? Or is it just... An imaginary thing. Well, we have to decide that. We don't know yet because we have to figure out what it's it's referring to. 
we have to we have to figure out how to to understand this. So the most fenced cities there is in historically is Sidon, right? That's going to be uh, what is going to be under siege. So we have to figure out what that means. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I may not know enough about this. I know when it deals with like Scopius, he's uh, Atolian. And there's this Atolian League um, and the Ptolemaic Egypt, they go against the Seleucids, right? So, in, you know, in a, in a sense, you can say, well, the Battle of Paneum is, is the Atolian League coming against uh, the the king of the north, right? Or the king of the north coming against them, however you want to look at it. But they're going to lose that battle. They lose the battle of Paneum. Um, <clears throat> right. And we know to Macedon, obviously, Alexander's a Macedonian, right? Um, so if you deal with uh, Philip, king of Macedon, and what he's symbolizing. Now, this would be um, which Philip, king of Macedon. It's obviously not the second. Um, so we have to keep moving. Lots of different ones, boy. So I don't know which king of Macedon this is. Philip the Fifth. So it's Philip the Fifth? Yes. Okay, so Philip the Fifth. Mm. Wikipedia doesn't have a page for it if you look up if you if you go to wikipedia looking for syrian wars yeah it'll give you an overview of all of them okay and under the fifth syrian war it speaks yeah. of the death of ptolemy the fourth in 204 yeah. and mm. then in the second paragraph Seeking to take advantage of this turmoil, Antiochus III staged a second invasion of Cull Syria. He convinced Philip V of Macedon to join the war and conquer the Ptolemies' territories in Asia Minor. Actions which led to the Second Macedonian War between Macedon and the Romans. Okay. And that speaks of how in 200 BC, Roman emissaries came to Philip and Antiochus, demanding that they refrain from invading Egypt. Okay. So, so that history seems solid, solid, right? Our understanding right. of it. Okay. So we got that correct. Um, so what would he represent then? Philip, king of... 
So you're saying Philip V, King of Massa. Right. So he has to represent something. Hmm. But now, now he's sort of employed by um to some degree by Rome, right? No. No, not by Rome? No. So how, how come he comes into play? Why does Antiochus? No, yeah, it wouldn't be Rome. Pardon me, I'm getting back. Yeah. So, so, so he just joins with Antiochus because of Rome's involvement with no. Egypt. No. Why is he involved? <clears throat> Philip and and Antiochus or Antiochus. Yeah are joining together, they're entering a league to go up against the Ptolemies. Okay. Rome comes in as the protector of the Ptolemies. So in this case, Rome was acting as a global policeman. Okay. So so who makes a lead, league with the apostate Protestants? In this case, what you have is you have Philip and Antiochus making a league. Rome is now seeking to make a league with Egypt. Okay, okay, that makes sense now. So so who does Philip of the fifth king of Macedon symbolize in our time? That's what we're all trying to figure out right now. I mean, yeah, so there should maybe. Well, there would be like United Nations, we would be making, the United States would be making a league with the United Nations, right? I'd have to consider that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Well, if Rome if Rome is the world police and they trying to make a league with Egypt, Egypt is a symbol of the world. So I mean that's what I was thinking anyway. Maybe my thinking's wrong. I just uh, you know, so we have to figure out what this this battle is about here. So I mean, we're saying that this is the Battle of Panium or the aftermath of the Battle of Panium, right? That's that's the idea here. Um, and the robbers of thy people come in and exalt themselves to establish the vision, papacy, right? You know, and uh, so you have. Would it just be the Protestant churches uniting with the United States? Well, that would make that would be logical, but is it going to fit in this case? Because this league between Philip and Antiochus was precipitated by the death of Ptolemy the Fourth. But that death was in two oh four BC. And the Fifth Syrian War took place for a period of seven years from 202 to 195. Yeah, so that's where you're going to have the Battle of Panium in that history. Right. The whole thing was that the Romans at that time did not want any disruption of the grain imports from Egypt because they were getting most of their grain from Egypt because they weren't doing that well as farmers. They were more focused on their conquest as soldiers. Okay. So it's not after the fifth Syrian war. It's during. During, right. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that and that's just Swearingen's uh, ideas getting in there. Right. Niche. But at this at this point, having Swearingen's as a 
as something that we're looking at, but we're also having to correct what we're not agreeing with, with what he did. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so we're not agreeing with it. Now we have this, um, this, I put those Hebrew numbers in there because I still think these are really significant. Um, now the other thing, the word, the thing is this word many, um, uh, that right is that the right number um oh it's the other way around seven two two seven so this number seven two two seven um is an interesting number just because it's a mirror right Do we agree with that 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 makes it interesting It's a mirror, it's a chiastic structure, it's however we want to see it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, um, now the word means much, many, great, many, abounding in, more numerous than, abundant, great, strong, greater than, much exceeding. Um, it also means captain or chief. It's another definition of it. Um, and it's uh, contracted from 7231. It's Rab, right, is the word itself, and it's from Rabab, right, which means uh, properly to cast and get, gather that is increase, especially in number, right? So, so there's something about that word, uh, especially in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. So it's giving us a specific uh, period of time. So... Um, If we added those three together, it gives us a period of 42 years and uh, 134 days. I don't know if there's something there that we would have to consider. Um, you know, 42 years puts us outside of our lines. <clears throat> so it's, uh, you know, 15,475. The difference between that and that uh, 14,715 days, the difference is 718. So that's kind of interesting. So if we take the phrase certain years and we have that be the period of time from uh, November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030, right? So this, this phrase here, and we took these numbers, H1992 plus H6256 plus H7227. So if we added these together, so I'll do this here. I know our time is almost up. Uh, we started a little bit late, though. Um, so I'm just going to add these together. I'll make it as a footnote. So if we have uh, 1992 plus um, 6256 plus... 722 or 7227 equals, well, that was a bad typing, um, uh, 15, uh, 15475. And if I subtract 14, 757, I get 718. 
So is that meaningful that I can take these two phrases that contain this word times, which is translated certain in one verse and times in the other, and add those together. So that phrase um, being in those times, there shall many, right? So that's, that's taking those three words, adding them together, and then subtracting those two numbers and getting July 18. Is that significant or not? It's very interesting. Okay. So, so I would think we would, we'd have to consider that this, this symbol is helping us, right? And, and they're not, they're not driving the interpretation, but they're helping us sort through some of these things. So we know that these are related to our lives. Right. So we got this July 18th symbol here. Now, you know, if we went that many days past April 5th, 2030, we're going to be getting a couple of years down the line, right? Because uh, 731 is, or 730, depending whether you have a leap year added to a year. Um, you know, so it's going to be less than two years between if we're just going to take that number, 718 days. Um, so... Seven twenty is three sixty, so uh, divided by two is three sixty. So you know it's just less than two prophetic years difference by two days. Um. Anyway, so we're going to leave it there for now. We're going to come back to this to try to understand this. But I do think there is significance in these symbols that we have seen other places that we, we just can't ignore this simple calculation. So anyway, thanks everyone. Let's uh, close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we've had to study this morning. We pray that you can bring us together again to open your word as we dig for truth. And um, forgive us our sins, help us to trust in you in all things. May your angels watch over us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.